Luke acts for beginners. Lesson number 11, Jesus enters Jerusalem, second part, Luke chapter 20, verse one to uh, chapter 21, verse 38. So with the second part, we are concluding the section where Luke describes the activities of Jesus in and around the city of Jerusalem. In our last lesson, if you remember, we left off at the scene where Jesus had chased off the money lenders from inside the temple area. In this section, Luke describes several encounters with various Jewish leaders who tried to either discredit or undermine Jesus with their questions and their traps. So they try various tactics in order to stop uh, Jesus, uh, and Jesus deals with each of these. The very first one is the tactic of confrontation. So let's read chapter 20, beginning in verse one. It says, on one of the days while he was teaching the, temple, uh, the people in the temple and preaching the gospel, the chief priests and the scribes with the elders confronted him. And they spoke saying to him, tell us by what authority you are doing these things or who is the one who gave you this authority? Jesus answered and said to them, I will also ask you a question and you tell me, was the baptism of John from heaven or from men? They reasoned among themselves saying, if we say from heaven, he will say, why did you not believe him? But if we say from men, all the people will stone us to death for they are convinced that John was a prophet. So they answered that they did not know where it came from. And Jesus said to them, nor will I tell you by what authority I do these things. So the chief priests and the scribes and the elders, they represent the highest levels of Jewish society. As a matter of fact, many of them may have been members of the Sanhedrin, which was the ruling authority over the people. So they come together to make a show of force. That's why they are together. I mean, they're facing one person, one rabbi from you know, up in uh, Nazareth, a nobody, and yet they're all together facing him and saying to him, how dare you? How dare you do such a thing? How dare you come into our temple area and do these things? And so Jesus had taken it upon himself to make a judgment call on the uh, on the propriety of commercial activity in the temple area. The thing that's not written here, but that we know, is that this commercial activity was profiting these leaders. You don't think that these merchants were inside the temple area doing business without having paid somebody to be there. That's not written there, but that's what was, that's what was going on. And so uh, Jesus comes in and he, he carries out swift, and rough justice on these guys, not only embarrassing the leaders, but also attacking one of their profit centers. So their response should have been, if they were true leaders, their response should have been, well, it's about time, or amen, or thank you for righting a wrong that we let happen. That should have been their response. Instead, they were annoyed, they were insulted that someone, as I say, a nobody from the north, would presume to do such a thing in an area, and here's the key word, in an area that they controlled. This was their area. They controlled what was going on. And this Jesus comes in and knocks everything over and throws out all these people and causes a commotion. So he obviously had a lot of courage, but who gave him authority to defy their authority? That was the real question here. Of course, the answer was that as the Son of God and the reason for the temple to be there in the first place, he had God-given authority. But to say this now would have provoked them uh, too soon. So Jesus finds another way to um, disarm them by asking them to name the uh, authority uh, behind John the Baptist's ministry. He does two things. One, he maintains the important discussion about spiritual authority, but he deflects the question uh, and the attention and the point from himself to John the Baptist. So all of a sudden it's no longer about him, it's about John the Baptist. And secondly, he forces them to acknowledge their lack of faith. If they said that John's baptism was from God, they would then have to also acknowledge that he, Jesus, was also from God, because this is what John the Baptist testified. That's why he said, why didn't you listen to him? By saying they didn't know, they confessed to, under, uh, to uncertainty, but they said this to avoid the displeasure of the crowd that did believe. So they're kind of you know, between a rock and a hard place here. So in their hearts, they didn't believe. 
And Jesus exposes this to themselves and to the many who followed and watched Jesus' ministry. So Jesus' own position about who John was and his mission was already stated in Luke chapter seven. So by not answering, the leaders lost the authority to demand an answer concerning Jesus' authority to cleanse the temple. He kind of boxed them in, they had nowhere to go. Now another point to consider was the timing for the declaration of his true identity in order to not provoke a riot or an arrest before the time, for this, uh, his time was not yet at hand. This may have played a part in the deflection of their, he could have said, I'm the son of God. Haven't you seen the miracles? I am the Messiah. I mean, if he would have said that right then and there, there would have been a riot. They would have called the, you know, they would have called the guards, had him arrested. There wasn't time yet. So Jesus follows this exchange with a parable that described the attitude and the end of those who rejected him. This is the parable of the vine growers. Luke chapter 20, I'm not going to read that. I, as, I, as I keep giving you assignments to read the passages, I'll just summarize this. This parable is a thinly veiled account that rebukes the disbelief and violence that he would ultimately suffer at the hands of these very religious leaders. Now vine growers, uh, the parable uh, is uh, basically vine growers who are entrusted with the vineyard by the owner who leaves on a long journey. And then people are sent by the owner to check on its progress and they're harassed and killed. Even the son of the owner is murdered in an attempt to seize possession of the vineyard. The owner returns to execute these men and their positions are given to others. This is basically the content of this parable. It was easy to spot the, par the parallel between the conduct of the vine dressers and these religious rulers. As I said, it was a thinly veiled parable. You couldn't miss who he was talking about. Now, one interesting feature of this passage is that Jesus quotes several Old Testament passages, Psalm 18, Isaiah 8, to support his teaching that rejection and violence against the Messiah was not only happening now to himself, but it was also spoken of by the psalmist and prophets long ago. In Psalm 118, 22, the psalmist wrote, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. So that's a prophecy in the, uh, in the, book, of, uh, in the book of Psalms. So if you look at the parallels between the parable and what was going on, the builders are the religious leaders who were often referred to at times as the builders of Israel. The stone, of course, was the Messiah who should have been laid, if you wish, as the foundation of the kingdom by these builders, but was rejected because they wanted to rule the kingdom. And the stone will cause many to stumble Direct opposition to the stone will fail, but those on whom the stone falls, there will be a judgment for those people. So it's quite unusual for Jesus to mix a scripture reference with a parable. You understand what I'm saying? Usually parable is just a story and he tells the story, but in this particular parable, he quotes you know, prophets from the Old Testament. That's a very rare thing. It doesn't happen very often in the, uh, in the, uh, in the New Testament. We keep moving through Luke, we get to Luke chapter 20, verse 19, and here the tribute to Caesar. So we're, we're just kind of running down the various confrontations that he has with people uh, in Jerusalem. This time the subject matter is tribute to, to Caesar. Let's read here. It says, the scribes and the chief priests tried to lay hands on him that very hour, and they feared the people, for they understood that he spoke this parable against them. So they watched him and sent spies who pretended to be righteous in order that they might catch him in some statement so that they could deliver him to uh, the rule and the authority of the governor. They questioned him saying, teacher, we know that you speak and teach correctly and you are not partial in any, but teach the way of God in truth. Is it lawful for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But he detected their trickery and said to them, show me a denarius. Whose likeness and inscription does it have? They said, Caesar's. And he said to them, then render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And they were unable to catch him in a saying in the presence of the people. And being amazed at his answer, 
they became silent. So this is a description of the reaction of these religious leaders to Jesus' parable. You know, they understood the parable, they got it, uh, and they wanted to seize him. Now this also serves as a bridge to the next scene of confrontation and entrapment, which we have just read here. Now if confrontation didn't work, maybe trickery would succeed. You know, they tried, how dare you? Who gives you the authority? And so he kind of, you know, he deflects that question. They, they, don't, they don't get a, an answer from him. So they're going to try to trick him now. Okay? Note in verse 23, Jesus detects exactly the trap and the attitude behind the question. He knows what they're doing. He knows what they're trying to do. So if he answered that they should pay the tax, they would brand him as a Roman sympathizer in order to discredit him before the people. If, on the other hand, he supported the non-payment of the tax, they would then report him to the Roman authorities as an agitator and have him arrested. See, there, there's the trick. They, they've got him on both sides. Instead, Jesus actually solves the dilemma that was faced by many sincere Jews at the time who were conflicted because they were being forced to pay taxes uh, to a pagan king using coinage that was blasphemous to them because it had an image of, it, of, the, of the Roman emperor on it. So they, they were talking about a real issue and problem for the people at that time. They had to pay taxes, but they had to handle this money, which was, you know, which was idolatrous to them. So Jesus solves this dilemma. He goes to the heart of the matter by making the distinction between the material and the spiritual. Some things, he says, like taxes, strictly belong to the material world. And while here, we must deal with them accordingly. Other matters are spiritual and we must follow God's commands regarding these things. Worship, morals, how we treat one another. The problem occurs when we mix the two. We make money our God, or we worship God or conduct ourselves according to man-made rules and ideas. So God has created both the spiritual and the material as well. Okay? God has created both the material and material, excuse me, the spiritual and material, as well as the way that we are to function in each world. And Jesus solves this dilemma, answers their question, gets out of their trap, but more importantly, I think, also solves the problem for the ordinary Jewish person of that time. So now we move on. Another confrontation, if you wish. This time a question concerning the, um, concerning the resurrection. So the leaders have tried confrontation and trickery and have failed. So they attempt to discredit Jesus by ridiculing Him. So let's read, uh, well, we won't read right away. The Sadducees, a little background here. The Sadducees um, bring one of these hypothetical situations for Jesus to comment on and meant to mock him and his teaching. So the Sadducees, they considered the Pentateuch, in other words, the first five books of the Bible, the Sadducees only saw this as authoritative. They, they, didn't, they didn't think the Psalms or the prophets or anything like that, that had no authority for them as far as scripture is concerned. For Sadducees, only the first five books of the Bible counted, Genesis to Deuteronomy. This was authority in comparison to the rest of the scriptures. They were a small group of conservative, wealthy priests, the Sadducees were. Their support politically came from the wealthy class, Whereas the Pharisees held sway over the common people. And by the way, the Pharisees, they believed all the Old Testament, the complete Old Testament. Um, it wasn't the Old Testament for them, obviously, but the complete scriptures had authority. Not only uh, the Pentateuch, but also the, the Psalms and Proverbs and the prophets, all of it had authority. So that was the main difference between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Sadducees also uh, supported by the wealthy, the Pharisees, were the teachers of the common people. Now, uh, the Sadducees believed that there was a great distance between God and man. They were like deists today. You know what a deist is? A deist is a person who believes that God created everything and then just stepped back. 
and has nothing to do with the creation. It just kind of goes on its own. Those are deists. We, you and I, we're not deists, we're theists. We believe that God created the world, yes, but also that God is involved in His creation. And the, the, you know, the most dramatic involvement is He's come as the Son of uh, as the Son of God, as Jesus. So we're, de we're theists. Okay? So the Sadducees, they were deists. They believed God created it and then just kind of stepped back. They believed that man's task was to maintain his daily life here because there was no other life. There was no afterlife. The, uh, the Sadducees didn't believe in life after death, they didn't believe in angels or those type of things. They taught that wealth and position were blessings from God given to show His approval. This is why many thought that poverty was a curse from God and a sign of His displeasure. So now I have a little background about the Sadducees and how they thought. Let's read the passage. Verse 27. Now there came to him some of the Sadducees who say that there is no resurrection. And they questioned him saying, Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies, having a wife and he is childless, his brother should marry the wife and raise up children to his brother. Now there were seven brothers and the first took a wife and died childless and the second and the third married her and in the same way all seven died, leaving no children. Finally the woman died also. In the resurrection, therefore, which one's wife will she be? For all seven had, um, had married her. So you know, this question here is like how many angels can fit on the head of a pin? You know, this this is the kind of question that, that this is. So their question actually is impertinent and it's mocking. They see themselves as so wise, ready to trip up this country rabbi with a trick question. So let's look at the answer he gives them. Jesus said to them, the sons of this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are considered worthy to attain to that age and the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage for they cannot even die anymore because they are like angels and are the sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. But that the dead are raised, even Moses showed in the passage about the burning bush where he calls the Lord the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. Now he is not the God of the dead, but the living, for all live to him. So Jesus responds to this impertinence with knowledge doesn't get mad at them. He demonstrates his knowledge and a knowledge that reveals immediately his superior divine knowledge and their ignorance about matters they thought they knew so well. Jesus uses the very skill that they prided themselves on. You know, scholarly examination and commentary of the scripture. They saw themselves as the scholars. So Jesus uses this very skill to prove that their teaching about the resurrection was incorrect. So first, he correctly interprets the meaning of a passage to prove that bodily resurrection takes place after death. He does so by drawing the logical conclusion based on the proper grammatical usage of the verb in the sentence in question. So amazing, <laughs> uh, it's so amazing. You're watching Jesus do expository preaching in front of these guys. I mean, he's showing them that he's like opening the text and he's pointing and he's saying, see over here, you're mistaken. Look, this verb here, this verb is in the present tense. Amazing stuff. Let me, let me just read the passage he's talking about, okay? Exodus 3. Then he said, uh, this is Moses here. Uh, then he said, do not come near here. Remove your sandals from your feet for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said also, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. Then Moses hid his face for he was afraid to look at God. Now, uh, this is the passage that Jesus is referring to. Look at the passage where in verse six, it says, he, meaning God, he said also, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, am. I mean, basic grammar, right? Am, that's the present tense, not I was, I am. So I am denotes the fact that Abraham and Isaac and Jacob are also present. This is the correct interpretation, defeating the no resurrection position of the Sadducees. 
one passage, one verb correctly interpreted, interpreted rather, wipes out their entire belief structure on the fact that they're, not the fact, but their belief that there was no resurrection. They only accepted the teachings of the law as authoritative. So what does Jesus do? He proves his point using their scripture. He goes to the Pentateuch, Exodus, second book of the Pentateuch. He goes to their scripture reference and he proves his point using their method, expository study, and their passage. He also demonstrates his divine knowledge and by so doing his divine nature as well, by revealing things concerning resurrection that only somebody from heaven could know. You can know from the scripture, as he demonstrated, that there is resurrection. You could know from the scripture that there is resurrection, but you, you couldn't know what that was like from the scripture. Only someone from heaven could know what that was like. And Jesus demonstrates this when he says to them that resurrected beings are like angels, pure spirits with similar powers. How could you know that? The scriptures didn't show you that. Only somebody who knew about that from personal experience could make that claim. And the fact that they do not marry or reproduce because they're eternal. No need to reproduce when there is no death. If there's no death, you don't need, to, you don't need more people. Heaven has a stable population. <laughs> no immigration issues there, at least. We can say goodbye to those. <laughs> so in verse 39 and 40, it says, some of the scribes answered and said, teacher, you have spoken well, for they did not have courage to question him any longer uh, about anything. That, that's the scriptural way of saying they got, beat, they got a beat down. <laughs> they got a beat down. <laughs> they, they had nothing else to say. They were embarrassed. So some scribes who were serious students and teachers of the scriptures uh, agree with Jesus, but the rest were silent, not wishing further, I think the word is humiliation. So now Jesus poses the religious leaders a question. Now he's not finished with them. All right, you know, you've tried to humiliate, uh, humiliate me, confront me, trick me. Okay, yeah, you th your best shot. Okay, now my turn. I have a question for you. So let's read that, verse uh, 41. It says, then he said to them, how is it that they say that Christ is David's son? For David himself says in the book of Psalms, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore David calls him Lord. And how is he his son? There, there's, a, there's a trick question. You want a trick question? I'll give you one. You know, today we would call this spiking the ball. He's already defeated them and so it's just boom, touchdown. So Jesus had dealt with intimidation, trickery and mocking. He has answered the questions and corrected their mistaken understanding about the resurrection. Now he goes one step further by asking them a question about the scriptures. Now his previous question about John the Baptist was tactical in nature. It was tactical. He boxed them in so that no matter what they answered, they would lose the argument. This question asks them to interpret a passage of scripture. This time, however, it was a passage that revealed something about the dual nature of the Messiah. So the answer to the question in verse 44 is the following. The Lord, that's God the Father, said to my Lord, that's God the Son, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet, in other words, until I give you complete victory, including victory over death. Now David spoke this prophecy through the power of the Holy Spirit. So the question is, David calls him Lord. How is he David's son? You know, it says David called him Lord. 
And then the scripture says that the one that David is calling Lord becomes David's son. How does that work? The answer, David calls the Son of God Lord before the Son of God comes into the world as a man and a physical descendant of King David through his earthly father, Joseph. That's the answer. David was addressing the Lord while the Lord was in heaven. And then the, the Lord became man in order to die for our sins. And how did he become man? Well, he became man through the descendants of David, Joseph actually, his uh, earthly father. At the time David spoke these words, Jesus had not yet come. 700 years later, Jesus became man through a descendant of David, who was Joseph. So the scribes and priests knew this scripture and they acknowledged that the Messiah would be a descendant of David, but they did not realize or refuse to admit that, as Jesus had just demonstrated, that the Messiah would also be divine. That's the key. That's the thing that they didn't grasp. What really bothered them was that this Jesus that stood before them claimed that he was that Messiah. It's one thing to have a revelation, to have some country preacher come along and, and be really good to point out things in the scripture that you hadn't seen and then solve a scriptural problem that had you know, kind of had them thinking for a long time. Who is David talking to when he says, you know, my Lord and then my Lord becomes my son? What, how, what is the meaning of that? To have you know, some nobody preacher come along and explain what that means, you know, that was a lot to swallow. But then to have that person say, and by the way, I'm that Messiah, that was too much. So now Jesus, after finishing the question, he gives a warning, verse 45. And while all the people were listening, he said to the disciples, beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and love respectful greetings in the marketplaces and chief seats in the synagogues and places of honor at banquets, who devour widows' houses and for appearance sake offer long prayers. These will receive greater condemnation. So the epilogue to this section is Jesus' warning concerning the hypocrisy of the scribes. This of course included the Pharisees. The warning is twofold. A, be careful that you not be victims of their schemes, unduly impressed by their pretense at holiness and importance. And two, be careful not to be like them in their attitude and their deeds. So Jesus reveals yet another hidden fact that only God would know concerning the judgment. There will be degrees of guilt and condemnation, another thing that they couldn't know unless they were from God or God Himself. So Jesus has just condemned the scribes for their hypocrisy and He continues this line of teaching as He describes the events leading to and including the final judgment. He's just said there's going to be a price to pay, there's going to be a judgment and He follows that warning with the talk of uh, the judgment that is to come to Jerusalem. So let's just read 21, the beginning. It says, and he, looked up and, saw the, and he looked up and he saw the rich putting their gifts into the treasury. And he saw a poor widow putting in two small copper coins. And he said, truly I say to you, this poor widow put in more than all of them, for they all out of their surplus put into the offering, but she out of her poverty put in all that she had to, um, to live on. So as a way of balancing the comments uh, regarding the uh, hypocrisy of the scribes, Jesus comments on the sincere faith and generous spirit of this widow's sacrificial um, offering. When it's compared to the perfunctionary giving of others with more physical resources who gave a greater amount, but not a sacrificial amount. This event takes place in the temple area and naturally it sets up a question about the temple itself which Jesus uses to elaborate on this issue of judgment, something the Jews will soon face because of their rejection of Jesus as Messiah. You, know, you need to remember, you know, you're reading through this, it's always about Jesus and the Jews. 
We're so fast in taking whatever's going on and trying to apply it in the 20, 21st century. But what's going on is between Jesus and the Jews, the fact that they are rejecting Him as Messiah. The parables are about that. The warnings are about that. We need to keep that in mind. So in verse five to seven, and while some were talking about the temple, that it was adorned with beautiful stones and votive gifts, he said, as for these things which you are looking at, the days will come in which there will not be left one stone upon another which will not be torn down. They questioned him saying, teacher, when therefore will these things happen? And what will be the sign when these things are about to take place? So these questions lead Jesus into a long teaching concerning the end times, the end for the Jews. Both Matthew and Matthew 24 and Mark 13 include this section in their gospels as well. So when you take all of the passages together, you know, Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 20, when you put them all together, you find that the apostles asked three questions. Number one, when will this happen and what signs will accompany this event? Meaning, see these stones, nothing. This whole thing is going to be destroyed. So they want to know, when is that going to happen? Two, what will be the sign of your return? Two, and three, what about the end times? At the end of the world time. Now for the Jews, they thought all of this was one event. The end of the world was when the temple would be destroyed and that's when Jesus would return. Because for them, the temple, that was their whole world. If the temple is destroyed and, 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 and Jerusalem is destroyed, that means it's the end of the world, period. That's the thing that they didn't, they didn't understand. Uh, that after Jerusalem was destroyed, the world kept on going. Okay? We need to keep that in mind also when we're studying these passages. Now Luke only records the first question asked by the apostles, but includes answers to both questions one and two. Again, don't have time to read all of this. Jesus answers the first question by describing the political and social situation in the world, the nation and the city, as well as the church that will preach, to the, uh, will preach the end of, excuse me, that will precede the end of Jerusalem. He also describes the suffering and the destruction that will take place. Then from uh, verses 25 to 36, Jesus gives them information concerning His return, which will coincide with the end of the world. See, their thinking is His return will be soon and it'll coincide with the destruction of Jerusalem, but that, that, was, not, that was not so. And then in verses 37, 38, Luke adds a comment that Jesus' devoted followers were listening to Him teach daily in the temple and Jesus would spend evenings in prayer. This call to prepare for judgment sets up the final events in Jesus' ministry, which is His crucifixion and of course His resurrection. So that whole section about the end of the world the same, provides the same information in the three places where it, it appears in Matthew, Mark, uh, and Luke, where Jesus explains not only a time that will come when the city will be destroyed and they need to be ready for that, but also the signs when He will return at the end of the world. And as long as you understand that he's, when He's talking about the destruction, He's talking about the destruction of the city, and then He talks about His return at the end of the world. Okay, a couple of lessons uh, from uh, today's uh, passages. We should all strive to give sacrificially, not just regularly. You know, we can easily become complacent in our giving and thus receive no blessing from it if there is no element of sacrifice in our offering to the Lord. It's a small, it's a small section there, a very small section where the widow gives her two mites in comparison to the rich who are going in and making a big show of their offering. I think that's a key element in, in, in our Christian lives. Our giving needs to have an element of sacrifice to it if it's to be effective, not only in pleasing God, but if it's to be effective in affecting us and helping us to grow spiritually. So we need to remember this idea of sacrifice in our giving, not just money, but you know, time and you know. When it doesn't matter and it doesn't give you, it doesn't cost you anything, what you give doesn't, is not worth much. It's when it costs you something, when it's, you know, it costs you a sacrifice to go somewhere, help someone, call someone, do something, give so much, 
when there's an element of sacrifice, then it, it, it transforms it into something spiritual at that point. And then just another lesson, the judgment is sure. The judgment is sure. The Jews ignored Jesus' warning of judgment to come. And we know historically that it came, right? In 70 AD, the Romans came, they tore everything down, they killed everybody, exactly as Jesus had said. So we need to make sure that we don't make the same mistake. You know, Jesus has told us there is a judgment coming. All of the things that happened in the past help us to understand what will come in the future. So there is a judgment coming. We need to be ready for it, faithfully, spiritually. All right, and then we have our assignment for next week, Luke 22, verse one to 2325. We're at lesson 11, so we only have two lessons to go. And I remind you that I'm going to continue here. We'll be in the auditorium next quarter in October. Um, and we're going to do the book of Acts. We're just going to go straight into the book of, uh, the book of Acts. Uh, and all I have to say is, if you think you know the book of Acts, you don't know the book of Acts. There is so much material in the book of Acts that I can't even, I can't even put it all in to, uh, you know, uh, I run out of time and paper uh, uh, preparing these lessons. Uh, so I encourage you to stick, uh, stick around for the book of Acts, which we will do uh, after we're finished. Luke. All right, thank you very much. That's our lesson for this morning.